Okay, so here is your background lecture for Antigone. So this will give you some of that background knowledge that will enable you to read the play more effectively. And the title of this lecture is The Theban Problem. Now, Antigone was written by a man named Sophocles, who lived from 496 to 406 BC. And this was during the height of the Greek, Greek city-states period and before the rise of the Roman Empire, which we're studying currently in our World History Project. He wrote approximately 123 plays in his lifetime. However, only seven remain with fragments of others. So we do know that he wrote more plays because of their mention in other historical records, but all we have are the seven complete ones. Now the Theban plays, they're a trilogy, right? And Antigone is the third play in a trilogy that conclude, that includes Oedipus Rex and Oedipus of Colonus. And so part of the function of this lecture here is to give you that background on the two plays that we're not going to read. That way when Antigone begins, you know what's going on because the play will assume that you know a lot of things. So let's look at the background to Oedipus Rex. And for the next few slides, these are things that happen even before Oedipus Rex. These stories were part of Greek culture, and any Greek audience going to see Oedipus Rex for the first time would already know these stories just by virtue of being members of that culture. So there's a lot of deep background to go through here. I'm going to just try to tell it like a story and interject a little bit of commentary here and there. And then when we move on to Antigone, I think a lot of this will make more sense. Right, so our deepest, deepest backstory begins when King Laius and Queen, Queen Yocasta of Thebes receive a prophecy from the oracle at Delphi, this very famous female prophet who lived up in the mountains and told it, you know, everybody's future and, you know, to the Greeks told it very well and very accurately. And the oracle tells them that they will have a son who will kill his father and sleep with his mother. Now, Yocasta and Laius are just horrified by this. Um, this is not okay. And so they order one of their slaves to get rid of the child. Right? And so they order the child's feet bound. Word, Ed, the name Oedipus actually just means swollen feet. And they order for him, they order him to be left on a hillside to die or be eaten by animals, right? Because to the Greeks, killing one's child, infanticide, was a horrible sin. So in Laius and Eucasta's mind, they're not actually killing this baby, they're just leaving it out on the mountainside. If the gods want the child to live, then the child will live. If the gods want the child dead, child will die on this rocky Greek mountainside. However, the slave, um, you know, who's a normal person, just like, you know, I think you or I would be, cannot leave this baby to die. And so he gives it to a shepherd from the nearby city of Corinth, right here. Here's this baby. Take it away. Don't ask too many questions. And um, so this baby, who is Oedipus, is taken to the king and queen of Corinth who have no children of their own, and they take the baby in and they raise Oedipus as their own child. And so Oedipus grows up a, a prince of Corinth, a, a normal princely life, and when he's about your age, he goes to find out his future. Again, a fairly common Greek ritual. And so he goes to Delphi to receive his oracle, and the oracle tells him his future. He will kill his father and sleep with his mother. Now, I think like you or I would be, Oedipus is shocked. He's horrified. This cannot happen. And so the only thing he can do is leave Corinth, which he does. And so he's walking out of Corinth. He's up in the Greek mountains. And he meets this rude stranger on the path, right? I mean, he's walking along this mountain hillside. This is goat path, right? It's really only big enough for one person to walk on at a time. And so he steps aside, right? Oedipus is a prince. He's a noble young man. He's been raised well. And so he steps off the path. And as he does, as the group walks aside, the leader of this group hits Oedipus with his son, with his stick. You know, he's disrespecting Oedipus. And Oedipus is a prince. He's going to put up with this. And he becomes enraged and kills the man and all of his servants except for one. 
Now I'm sure you can make a prediction who that man was. Um, Oedipus, in running away from Corinth, eventually arrives at Thebes, where a horrible monster called the Sphinx has been terrorizing the city. And what the monster does, it sits outside of the city gates and it asks passers-by a riddle. And the losers become the uh, Sphinx's lunch. The riddle is as follows. What animal goes on four legs at the dawn, two legs at midday, and three legs in the evening? Do you think you can guess? The answer is man, right? A baby goes on four legs, an adult goes on two legs, an old person goes on three legs with the aid of a cane. And so Oedipus answers the riddle correctly, and the Sphinx goes away. Uh, in some stories it dies, in some stories it just flies off, whatever. The Sphinx is gone, and Oedipus is now a hero. And Thebes is currently without a king, because Laius left for a journey and never returned. And so the newfound hero marries Queen Yacasta. All right, and so that's the background to Oedipus Rex. So this next section covers the play itself. Uh, the text of the play opens um, some years after the defeat of the Sphinx. And again, Thebes is being attacked by plagues, insects, disease. It's not really clear, but it's just being plagued. And the now mature and stable King Oedipus vows to seek revenge. Or I'm try, sorry, vows to seek out the source of the curse and eradicate it from Thebes. And so Oedipus sends for the blind prophet Tiresias, who tells him that he is the source of the curse. Oedipus, being blind in his pride, does not believe Tiresias. And eventually the slave and the shepherd are brought out, and they confirm that Oedipus is indeed the baby who was ordered killed many years ago, as Tiresias had said. And as the slave and the shepherd are standing there revealing Oedipus's past, Yocasta slips away into her and Oedipus's bedroom and hangs herself over the bed, a very ironic and symbolic death. And when Oedipus comes in and finds her, he is overcome with grief, and he takes the jeweled pin out of her robe and he gouges his own eyes out. He is horrified by what he has seen and horrified by what he has done. And Oedipus leaves Thebes a broken man. And that is the end of the play Oedipus Rex, the first of the trilogy. The second play, Oedipus at Colonus, is not often read. It takes place at Colonus and is basically a long conversation between Oedipus and the young woman who is both his sister and his daughter by Yocasta. Um, she has gone with her sort of brother, father, to comfort him. It is an extended, med the whole play itself is this extended meditation on fate, pain, and wisdom. And at the end of the play, Oedipus dies. And so let's <laughs> take a moment to look at the Theban family rectangle. Theban family tree, or whatever we want to call it, right? So first, in the first generation, we have Laius and Yocasta, the king and queen. In the second generation, we have Oedipus and Yocasta, the king and queen. And then we have their children, right? Ateocles, Polynices, the older two, who are boys, and Antigone and Ismene, who are the younger, and they are daughters. All right, so let's go off to the side for a second. We're going to look at another play for a moment that is not part of Sophocles' trilogy. Um, it's a play called Seven Against Thebes by the playwright Aeschylus. See, this whole Theban problem, which is the subject of this lecture, again, was a common cultural, culture story for the Greeks. And so we have many different playwrights and poets and actors and musicians participating in the building up of this story. I think the best analogy I can make is to the Star Wars stories that are part of our culture. Right? We have these video games, movies, books, comic books. We have all this stuff, TV shows, right, that go into the larger Star Wars story. We have the original three movies, later six movies, but then we have all this other stuff that builds up the Star Wars story. And so Seven Against Thebes is part part of this larger Theban story. And so after Oedipus's death, 
Yacasta's brother Creon is put on the throne, right? It's felt that the boys, because they are the sons of incest, um, are not fit to rule. And um, Oedipus's son, Ateocles, supports Creon, feels that this is the right decision. But his other son, Polynices, doesn't. And he gathers an army from seven neighboring kingdoms to try to put himself, Oedipus's rightful son, on the throne of Thebes. So that's where we get the title, Seven Against Thebes. And so the war is the subject of, of this play. And so within this story, the brothers kill one another in the war. And the defenders of Thebes are victorious in keeping Creon on the throne. And Polynices, who is disloyal to Creon, and actually a traitor, right? Going out and getting foreign soldiers to attack one's own city is treason, um, whether justified or not. Um, and so right before the play Antigone begins, Creon's body... Creon has decreed that Ateocles' body will be buried with full honors, while Polynices' body will be left to rot unburied, meaning that his soul will never find peace. This is a very serious punishment, a very horrible punishment for Creon to decree, but Polynices has done a horrible thing. He's committed treason against his city, has killed his own brother, and has attacked his uncle. And so, either way, this is just a bad scene. Uh, Creon's decree also states that anyone who buries Polynices will be put to death by stoning. And so this brings us into the play Antigone. Antigone is going to refuse to allow her brother Polynices to be neglected. And indeed, when the play opens, she is talking to her sister Ismene, and she has resolved to disobey. And so the tragic cycle for poor Thebes begins again in the play Antigone. And the play really presents us with a few driving questions that will frame our reading and analysis of the play. Right? Would you follow the law of the gods and bury your brother, or would you follow the law of, of the state and obey the king? What is more important, the family or the nation? And if we only think about our family and the nation falls, doesn't everyone's family then fall? What happens if everyone disobeys the laws? Right? What happens if we all follow our own conscience? Will that result in anarchy or will it result in a more just and peaceful and merciful state? And then finally, how does the idea of civil disobedience fit into this? How do you break the law honorably and nobly in order to protect your conscience um, while still showing those in authority that what they're doing is wrong. That's civil disobedience. And so that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, be sure to complete the questions from the lecture in, in your study guide um, and write that down. We're not going to take our exam on Antigone until we're done reading it, but you're going to want to make sure the first third of your study guide is complete. Thanks.